All right, well, we're continuing in our study of Daniel chapter 11. Open your Bible there. We hope to get through verses 31 to 35 this morning. We're moving close to concluding our series on Daniel, which is a kind of introduction to the prophet to the prophecy series. <laughs> actually, I'm not kidding. This study is actually introductory to all that follows. And we'll be going from here into Revelation. We'll do a kind of a review and recap of what we learned in our series on Revelation chapters 1 through 4, and uh, this, the recap will probably take us about three or four years, and when we get through with that, we'll start in Revelation 6, I mean, three, I said one, 1 through 5, and then we'll start in chapter 6, and chapter 6 will take about a year, chapter 7 about half a year, chapter 8 about two years, I'm just kidding around, but you, you know, these, yeah, it's, uh, it's intensive when we want, we're dedicated to just doing a thorough study of prophecy. All right, we're trying to do a thorough study here and touch on every prophetic passage in the Bible. <laughs> so that's what we're trying to achieve uh, with the work we're doing together here. All right, with your Bible then open at Daniel chapter 11. Uh, while you're getting situated there, let me uh, bring you up to speed on what's going on with. Here we go. There we go. What's going on with our project here with God's War? Uh, this book, as you know, is a book I've been working on for about, well, really, it's a kind of a lifetime uh, of study behind all of this. But actually trying to sit down and, and write the book has been a project that's taken about six years. Now, that doesn't mean that every day, eight hours a day, I've worked on this book. That's not true. It's off and on, off and on, bits and pieces here and there. But over a period of six years is what it's taken to put this together finally. And uh, with all of our efforts and all the money we invested on on proofreaders and everything, I still find little typo gremlins hiding here and there, jumping out and biting me while I'm reading this thing. So probably about the fifth edition of the book, we'll have cleaned up all the typos. I'm just, well, sort of kidding around. That's usually how it works. There's something about getting the book in your hand published that you all of a sudden see the typos. Why is that? Right, Anna? You know what I mean? It's just, it, it's enough to make you crazy. But I don't need to get fixated on that. <laughs> The message is here, God's war, and the book is there, and it's a hardback, see, amen. So this is good, because you can get those devils and hit them, <laughs> bang, and it'll knock them out, but anyway. So finally, it's here. Most of you have uh, purchased a copy of it and, and got your discount and everything. Just a little secret between you and, and me members of the church can continue to get that 25% discount, but that's only for members of the church. Or people who attend regularly, okay? If you attend regularly, you can still get the 25% discount on the book. But you have to use a secret, super secret code to do it. So what you have to do is you have to email me and say, Yo, preach, I'd like to have the book. And then I send you the super secret code. It works one time. Now, no, it's serious. This is how we're doing this. <laughs> it, the, and that code is, is designed specifically for you. And you use it one time and it no longer will be used in the world. I'm just kidding around, but that, I'm not kidding around. That's how we're doing this. So if you, if you haven't bought it yet, you missed the 25% discount. If you're a member of the Lighthouse Baptist Church, you can still have that discount. Send me an email. Say you want it. I send you the code. You use the code, and then you get the book for 25% off. Okay? The deal? That's for members only, so don't give that to your friends. All right. Um, we also have some little pamphlets out there. Brother Lloyd, would you grab enough of those little pamphlets to bring me one and to give everybody here one of them. I would appreciate that. Thank you, brother. We have a little short summary of the book, which we're using to obviously promote it. We want to get the message out there. I mean, obviously we want to sell the books. Good night. We put a whole bunch of money into this thing. I, I read a tweet uh, the other day. Some guy wrote, uh, quit selling this stuff. It's for the kingdom. Give it away. Yeah. Thank you, brother. And make sure everybody else gets one. Whether you want one or not, I want you to have this, okay? You can throw it away, whatever you want to do with it, but I want you to have it. Uh, anyway, yeah, I read that tweet, and I, everything in me wanted to respond to it, but I decided not to because you just get into an argument with somebody, and it goes on and on and on. You never, they never let go. Um, if you run into that spirit, I got to tell you, that's amazing. You know, you, uh, let me, uh, is, he, is that guy not working for the kingdom when he goes to work? And why does he get a check? It's just stupid. It's so stupid to think that way. I mean, in a way, that's exactly what we're doing. You see, when you buy it, 
you're investing in getting the message out. That's what you're doing. So we're all collectively together doing this thing. So anyway, you don't muzzle the ox that's treading out the corn, amen? Right, that's a biblical principle. So uh, at any event, yes, there's a cost involved in presenting the materials, and therefore there's a charge involved in distributing them. <laughs> Does that make sense? There's a cost involved in producing them, so there has to be a charge involved in distributing them. And uh, do I make any money on it? Well, we'll just have to wait and see. Frankly, I don't know, but I hope so. The, the, the ox plows or the, the, the farmer plows with the hope of some increase, amen? Just like you go to work and all that kind of stuff and you hope to get some kind of a paycheck to pay your bills. This is part of how I supplement my income. Not that the church doesn't give me enough. It's appropriate what we get, but we do need to supplement our income. And I won't go into it any further than and the personal stuff, you know, things like... Uh, uh, I just don't want to go into too much personality. But yeah, there's some, I, I hope to make some money with this. Uh, how about about $5 million? <laughs> That'd be nice. I can tithe on that and give to the missionaries. I can do a lot of wonderful things. Huh? huh? Run then I can run for president. Yeah. No, you need about $6 billion for that. Yeah, $6 billion for that. Just kidding around. Anyway, this little book, this is a summary of the book. All right? It, it just summarizes its message, gives you a taste or a flavor of it in a short bite see so if you want more of these to help me promote the book take as many as you want there's a whole box of them out here and that that's what this is for this is to give to people so they'll look at it and go no i'd like to read the rest of that by the way that's happened a couple of times we've had people get the pdf version and they have read it and then said i want i want the book i read the summary i like it i want to read the rest of this so we've had a couple of People respond already that way. So help me get it out there. This is kind of a, it is an advertisement, but it's also more than that. It's the message, okay? This is something I failed to emphasize. I don't want to be pretentious in any way. Yes, it advertises the book. But you should understand the message of the book is in this little pamphlet. And that's by design. Because even if they don't buy the book, at least they get the message, right? Right? And the message we're distributing for free. Amen? Now, we hope they'll look at that and go, oh, I'd like to learn more about that and buy the book. But if they don't, at least we got the message out there. Now, we're going to attach a, a little gospel presentation back here, too. And we'll use this. I'm going to talk to the leadership about that. We might also use this for a tract for our church. But we got to get a more. The gospel's in there, but it's not as clear and laid out like I'd like. So we'll make sure that happens. Enough of that. Daniel chapter number 11. Let's go ahead and get started in our study. I'm going to do it with just a little bit of review. You haven't seen this for a couple of weeks, and you probably forgot everything that's on it. All right, so we're, we're looking at, in Daniel 11, we're looking at the transition from the third to the fourth kingdom. And then the things that go on from, from that transition time to the rise of Antichrist in the earth. So Daniel 11 prophetically runs from about 164 B.C., Two, question mark, and that is the time Christ returns, or the time that Antichrist, actually this goes to the time Antichrist is killed, and then Daniel 12 picks it up from there, and we'll, we'll look at that later. So, we have uh, the churches at this time in history that are here with holding the spirit of Antichrist from rising, but when the church is removed, then Antichrist will rise, <laughs> and, uh, and that's when we go into the the whole end of the world scenario. The rise of Antichrist is the theme of Daniel chapter number 11 particularly. And actually it's, the, it's a, a focus of the entire book. Although the ultimate focus, the end of focus is Christ's return to the earth. This guy's coming after you. If you weren't watching, you missed a really exciting part of the lesson. Anyway, so Daniel describes the career of the Antichrist of whom Jesus speaks in Matthew 24, verse 15. We established that, this is key, Daniel 11, 21 to 45, must be taken together as one continuous narrative. And that it speaks of Little Horn, that entire passage does. We're now studying this prophecy, integrating Daniel's other revelations about Little Horn into an interpretation of this passage, 
Daniel 11 is, by all, by all accounts, <coughs> certainly among the most difficult prophecies to decipher. And it's, there are a lot of reasons for that. But one of them is basically this. The Bible says it is the glory of God to conceal a thing. It is the honor of kings to dig it out. Do you know that? Yeah. And you're all kings. You say, well, where's my crown? And some of them said, told you so. Anyway, so uh, we're, but we are all kings and priests unto God. So God on purpose sometimes puts things in a way that requires us to roll up our sleeves and get into his word and spend enough time in his word to dig it out. It's almost a hide and seek kind of scenario in some ways. And that's just one of several reasons that God sometimes presents his message in superficially, you would think, an enigmatical way. Open your Bible to Daniel 11 verse 31. <coughs> now let's get started. Daniel 11, verse number 31. We covered verses 28 to 30 last time. Today we'll pick it up at 31 where the Bible says, And arms, what does that mean? Military might, arms, armaments, force of military power, and arms shall stand on his part. What does that mean? That he will be given military might that will stand with him and for his interests to support his program, to support his plan. So a military force is going to be given to him. And remember, in uh, Revelation chapter 6, we have the four horsemen, or the four horses of the apocalypse. It's the same man each time. It's the four horses of the apocalypse. And in the second stage of his development, he's given a great sword with which he takes peace from the earth. They shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice. And they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. A couple of things about this prophecy, or this part of the prophecy, is he's talking about what they're going to do. We are not at the place in the prophecy where it describes him doing it. We're at the place in the prophecy where it declares it's coming. That's important. Because it isn't done here. Other things go on. It's almost as if the Holy Spirit is saying, okay, here's, what's, here's what we're doing. And then starts detailing the steps that lead to it. All right. And then it happens. So at this place, he's saying, here's what they're going to do. And then verses 32 and so on. It starts describing the steps that lead to the fulfillment and completion of this particular prophecy. All right. So let's go ahead and get into this. And we'll, uh, see, I went ahead too fast. All right. That's all right. Uh, Daniel 11:31 speaks of the prophecy concerning the abomination of desolation. The removal of the daily sacrifice and setting up the abomination of desolation. <clears throat> Let me give you a little, we'll go back a little bit. Remember in Daniel 8, it talked about removing the daily sacrifice and it talked about the transgression of desolation. And remember, I've brought to your attention the fact that Jesus, when he called it the abomination of desolation, he was taking from the two places that Daniel speaks of it and putting them together into one expression. In one place, Daniel calls it the transgression of desolation. In another place, he calls it the, uh, the uh, transgression. Of, uh, uh, I forgot how he puts it. The de anyway, the abomination that maketh desolate. That was it. Okay? The abomination that maketh desolate. So Jesus took those two times that Daniel referred to this event. He put them together in one expression, the abomination of desolation which is great because it tells us that in both of those instances, even though Daniel used different language to identify the same thing, he was identifying the same event. And it gives us insight into what that event is all about. <laughs> it's a transgression, of course, that is an abomination, and it results in desolation, is the bottom line. So that prophecy in Daniel 11.31 is talking about the removal of the daily sacrifice and then the placement of the abomination of desolation, or the abomination that make it desolate. All right. These two things are related. In Daniel 8, he refers to the removal of the daily sacrifice and focuses on that very particularly. And then he talks about this event called the transgression of desolation, or the abomination that make it desolate. 
that event Jesus called the abomination of desolation. That's the event we focus on. Interestingly, Daniel tends to focus on the aspect of that event that involves the removal of the daily sacrifice. We focus on the aspect of that event that involves the setting up of the image of abomination in the holy place. See, Jesus explained in Matthew chapter 13 that when they see the abomination that maketh desolate stand in the holy place, that gives us added insight into this event. It's, a, it's an idol or an image of the beast that is brought into the Holy of Holies, which of course tells us the temple is in place at this time in history. And he takes the image of jealousy, it's referred to in another prophecy, and brings it into the Holy of Holies. And then he sits in there and he calls himself God. And that's the event that's called the abomination of desolation. It's connected to another event, which is the removal of the daily sacrifice. So let me give you the scenario here. <laughs> the temple will be rebuilt, <clears throat> and we think that could happen tomorrow, but I'm being facetious. That could happen anytime. <clears throat> and I do believe it will probably happen shortly. So the temple will be in place, and the sacrificial system will be in operation. They're going to be bringing the lambs, the Passover lamb and all that, and they're going to be killing the... That's weird, don't you think, because of all the PETA noise we hear today? Yes. Right. Well, because you refer to it as the daily sacrifice. That's why. The daily sacrifice is very specific biblical language that refers to a very specific thing. It's not vague. It's not a daily sacrifice. The oh, you're right about that. Who said God was in any of this? <laughs> this is all this is all junk. Oh yeah, thank you for okay. Actually, what you've done is help me bring out a very important point. Thank you for that. People make this mistake all the time. <clears throat> when the Jews rebuild their temple, that's not God's house. God's house today is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. But there are a lot of Christians who think that way. If the Jews rebuild the temple, oh, wonderful, the house of God is back. No, that's not the house of God. That's totally Ichabod. Glory has departed from that. There's no glory in it. <clears throat> we love the Jewish people. Amen? Anybody here that doesn't? You anti-Semite. You know, right? We don't, we don't cotton to, if you heard my show this week, you know where I'm going there. We don't cotton to the anti-Semitic spirit at all. And I love Israel and believe she has a right to her land, and I believe all of that. <clears throat> but listen, this shocks people when they, when they tell me, let's just get, let's get some Bible on this, shall we? <coughs> the Apostle Peter said, in clear terms, ye were not the people of God. You were, no, actually what he says, you, ye were not a people. But now ye are, and he's talking to Gentiles, I didn't clarify that. Peter's talking to Gentiles. Read the first few verses of his book. To the Gentiles, and he's saying to them, Ye were not a people, but now you are the people of God. The expression the people of God doesn't refer to the Jews alone. It refers to Jew and Gentile who are in Christ. We're one new man created in Christ Jesus, Jew and Gentile. I haven't labored on that doctrine a lot. I've touched on it many times, but I do need to preach a couple of messages that just really clarifies all of that. <clears throat> the Jews, you know, continue to be uh, <laughs> close to the center of God's heart and all that kind of stuff. But the whole point, you're, you're, you're messing up God's program. The whole point of what God's doing with the Gentiles is trying to provoke them to jealousy. 
That's what it says in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. Thank you, son. Appreciate that. Thank you. So God is, he said, that's what he's doing. Provoking them to jealousy. So they look at us and say, look at all the favor God's put on them. That favor used to be on us. But it's like we go out of our way to interfere with what God's trying to do with what he's doing. Now, <clears throat> what happens though, <clears throat> people get fleshly about it and carnal about it and haughty and foolish and stupid about it and think that they are above the Jews. Not above anybody. But neither are they. You know, what God did in the gospel is he just leveled out the playing field. Jew and Gentile. Y'all come. That's what the church is all about. It's supposed to be Jew and Gentile together on, say, on even ground. <clears throat> he had to overcome that with Peter, remember? <clears throat> Peter was having a hard time with his business. And so God met him there in the upper room and showed him a sheet with a bunch of pig food on it, a bunch of Gentile food. He said, rise up and eat. Peter said, I'm not eating that. He said, not, uh, pig meat is not one time touch my lips, Lord. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Those of you who know the Bible, I'm trusting that you know it. <clears throat> but you can read about it in Acts chapters 10 and 11. So Peter says, I'm not going to eat that. And God says, don't you call unclean what I have called clean. That was a huge message for, for, um, for, for that Jewish man because then when he accepted that, he yielded to it. God said, I got an assignment for you. I want you to go talk to this Gentile and give him the gospel. What were Peter's first words when he walked in that house? You know that it's against the law for people of my nation to come into the house of one of you guys. First, hello, welcome to my home. I just want you to know. But God told me to come here and to not call unclean what he has called clean. You know, a lot of Jews need to learn that. A lot of Gentiles need to learn this. That it's not about Jew and Gentile today. Now, God has given the kingdom to the Gentiles. That's true. But as far as his household is concerned, he's opened the doors to Jew and Gentile and all are invited to come in through Jesus Christ. So coming back to Pat's very excellent observation. Because he's thinking, wait a minute now. In the New Testament, the bloody sacrifice of bulls and goats would be totally in, unacceptable. Amen. We don't do that. We're not coming back to God. And the, the signal of we've come back to God isn't when we start doing those sacrifices again. That's going away from God. <laughs> and that's the whole point of this period of time in history. The Jews will have their temple but it will not be under God. They will resume their sacrifices, but those sacrifices, every single one of them will be an offense to God. Why? Because the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, was shed once for all. And He removed all of those sacrifices because they were fulfilled in Christ. So it, for, for the Jews, during this time in their history, the Jews are doing these sacrifices as a statement that we don't accept Jesus Christ. We reject Jesus Christ. We don't believe he was the Messiah. We don't accept the idea that he was a lamb of God. We repudiate the, the idea that his blood washes our sins away. Oh no, this is the way it's done. Moses and his law. That's what's going on during that time. <clears throat> now, the, now, I don't doubt that there will be some sincere but misguided people. Right? There'll be plenty who will be so happy that we've come, we've been able to come back to God through our sacrifices, but they're wrong. It's like the many misguided people today in the church who think this, that, or the other thing, but they're wrong. You can believe sincerely in something, but sincerity isn't what makes something true. See? It's whether or not it's true is what makes it true. <laughs> Please try to tell the Democrats that. <laughs> so, all of that is to say, to clarify something important, what we're talking about right here is not people coming back to God. We're talking about people having, uh, coming back to their religion. I mean, it'd be like, it'd be as 
much coming back to God as well. Maybe I was going to, I was going to offer an analogy that I actually, I thought about and it doesn't work. So I'm not going to do it, <clears throat> but you see the point. All right. So they're offering these sacrifices, but God is not accepting single one of them. Not one of them. The only sacrifice he accepts is a sacrifice of, of his son, Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. That's it. Now this does raise the question about what about the millennial kingdom and the sacrifices then? You're going to have to wait for that. If I tell you everything now, you won't come back next Sunday. I'm kidding around. <clears throat> but no, there's more. And, we, and we'll get into the same question comes up when we get into the millennial kingdom and whether or not there will be blood sacrifices during the millennial kingdom. I'll just give you one little hint. Read Ezekiel that describes the, new te the, the uh, millennial temple and try to find blood in it anywhere. Interesting, huh? There's no ordinance for blood sacrifice in the book of Ezekiel with regard to the millennial kingdom. But we'll get into that. That's for later on. Right now, let's stay right here. Okay, we will. So, does that answer the question, though? You understand? Okay, so they're, they're doing these sacrifices, but they're not honored by God. And there will be some scornful rulers of the Jews who will go along with Antichrist, see? Remember, we, we labored on that a little bit last week. <clears throat> and what will happen is after they make the covenant, three and one half years later, exactly three and one half years later, he's going to remove the daily sacrifice. And the expression, the daily sacrifice, again, a very specific expression, it refers to the Old Testament commandment for the daily sacrifice to the priesthood. So, because that's what's going to be revived. <clears throat> the Jews won't be coming to Christ at this time until later. They don't, the Jews don't turn to Christ until they see the wounds in his hands inside. And they say, and, and, and they have that encounter where they see him whom they had pierced. And then they repent. That's when the Jews as a nation finally come to their Messiah. But they're not there yet. All right, so. He removes the daily sacrifice. And so what that means is they're bringing the daily sacrifice. Every single day they present these sacrifices according to the law of Moses in the Old Testament. And then they're allowed to do that <clears throat> up until the middle of the week. At that time, the man of sin has enough force and power on his side to come in and remove it and deny them any further sacrifices they can't do it anymore <clears throat> and then he's going to demand that they worship him he's going to demand they accept him as their messiah <clears throat> i'm sorry now i believe i'll show this in more detail i like to do that just throw it out there and then come back and you know shore up the foundation for the statement all right what i'm what i'm going to show you though as we go through this is i believe antichrist will have his image outside the temple For a while. But at this point, he's going to take that image and move it into the Holy of Holies. And that's going to be the end of the covenant that he had with Israel. They're going to have a deal where he can do his thing and then we can do our thing. Okay? And devil man's going to say, yeah, you go ahead and do your worshiping things. <coughs> you can continue your daily sacrifice. And we'll leave that alone. But at the middle of the week, he's going to renege. He's going to make them stop offering anything to God. Even though God's not receiving it. He doesn't even want any semblance of, of any kind of recognition of God. He wants to be recognized as God. So he stops them from making any kind of an offering to God. And he takes that image and he puts it in the Holy of Holies. And that's the event we call the abomination of desolation. And that's its relationship to this business of stopping or ending the daily sacrifice. <coughs> Man, sorry. <coughs> the arms that stand on his part refers back to Daniel 8, verse 12, where it talks about the host that would be given to the Antichrist with which he would cause the daily sacrifice to cease. See, we're trying to show you how those prophecies concerning Antichrist given to us earlier in Daniel's prophecy, how they fit in to this prophecy in Daniel 11. <clears throat> well, you notice here, there's these arms that stand on his part. 
connected with him removing the daily sacrifice, that takes us back to Daniel 8, 12, where a host, which always refers to an army, a host is given to the Antichrist that allows him now to move in and remove the daily sacrifice. So the picture you begin to get is, <clears throat> although the church has been removed, there continues to be, just on a human level, resistance to this guy who wants to be a dictator. You know, there are some people who don't believe in God, but they do believe in freedom. You know what I mean? There are some people who don't believe in God, but they do believe in, you know, um, rights. They might be confused about where the rights come from, but they do believe in them. See? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> these people... <coughs> there are going to be some of those people here, but without the presence of the Holy Spirit, they have no power to resist. That's what we see happening. Because the Holy Ghost has been withdrawn. He's the only force in earth that can hold him back. So with that force withdrawn, now the Antichrist has freedom to roll in, but we might have had the image in our mind that when the Holy Ghost is withdrawn, the whole world just collapses into his hands. It doesn't work that way. There's a period of time where now they're just wars and rumors of wars and nation rising against nation. <clears throat> I mean, pride and arrogance is part of the whole system of Satan's kingdom. And there are people who are going to say, no, I want to be the leader. And then somebody else says, no, I'm going to be the leader. No, I'm going to be the leader and all this kind of stuff. And somebody's going to say, well, who do you think you are to come here and, and take over? And Egypt's going to rise up against them. And then Rome's going to step in there and say, who do you think you are? Right? We talked about that, how Egypt's going to resist, <clears throat> but they will not be able to withstand. <coughs> Man, I'm so sorry. So Egypt's going to resist, but they will not be able to, res to withstand. And then Rome's going to get involved. We talked about that at some length last time. They will not be able to withstand, but he will be resisted. As a matter of fact, even after all that, there's going to be a pocket of resistance among mighty ones of God. Now, this is something that tweaks some people, but there are going to be some mighty servants of God on the earth during this time. There will be some genuine believers here. <clears throat> the church is removed, but that doesn't mean people can't believe. It doesn't mean nobody can believe in God anymore. I'm going to get into that because there's this verse that says that God will send them strong delusion because they, did, uh, they refused the truth, and so God will give them over to believe the lie. We're going to talk about all that, and I'll explain that to you. In fact, I think that might come up in the next lesson, if I remember right. No, it doesn't. It's the, it's the transition message between Daniel and Revelation. Sorry, I'm remembering my outline here. <coughs> but, <coughs> but anyway, there's going to be a group of people that resist the Antichrist even to the point of being able to kill him. Yeah. I'm getting ahead of myself in my lesson. I left my notes. Who knows? When that happens, it's just free fly, you know. Or free fall. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, so what happens is he commits this abomination of desolation. And then he sets up his palace on the sides of the mountains in Israel. He sets himself up as God. The Bible says that an individual is going to get to him and kill him with a deadly wound. That's at the middle of the week. <clears throat> at the same time that's happening, spiritual things are going on in the heavens, and Michael is given power over Lucifer, the dragon. Now that's significant because earlier, you know, Michael wouldn't touch him. <clears throat> Michael said, <clears throat> the Lord rebuked thee. It took, earlier it took Gabriel and Michael to double team to hold him back, assuming the Prince of Persia is a reference to Satan. If not, it's even more significant because it means it took a double team of God's mightiest angels to hold back one of Satan's princes. He was very powerful at that time, but by the time we get here, he's losing his power. The war that's been waging in heaven, Revelation chapter 12, is beginning to turn to the side of God's angels. And Satan is losing his power. I'm going to explain why and how all that is very interesting stuff. And the Bible says in Revelation 12 that Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and his angels, and Michael won. And now Michael takes that dragon and he throws him down to the earth. And he comes 
full of fury, knowing that he has but a short time. That's a pivotal battle. Remember, everything happens in the spiritual before it shows up in the physical. So that spiritual stuff going on up there is what precedes the physical. So at the time that Satan loses, I'm, I'm speculating in some measure here, but it's based on a whole lot of understanding of the picture that is drawn for us from Scripture. So, But I believe what happens is Satan loses spiritually, that's when Antichrist gets killed physically. Satan is cast out of heaven. He comes down and he performs a mock resurrection. He picks up the body of Little Horn and makes it look like it's alive. And he mocks a resurrection. We believe that's probably what he had in mind with Moses. But God didn't let him have it. He hid the body. Isn't that interesting? He didn't want anybody grabbing that body, mummifying it, and worshiping it. Or anything else, other kind of nonsense for the humans. Uh, whether Satan saw where God put it, I don't know. But we know that Michael stood to stop him. You can't have this body. And they disputed. But Michael had to say, Father, or God, he won't call him Father. But Lord, the Lord rebuke him. So it's just, isn't this interesting stuff? It's really fascinating how this is going on. So Antichrist is going to have like a mock resurrection, and that's who that's the that's the devil man now. He's he's Satan incarnate at that point. And that, that's the last three and a half years. But I've gotten so far ahead of myself. We might as well just forget my notes here. Let me go to my conclusion. But it turned into an interesting lesson anyway. In fact, I think the lesson the Lord had planned for us was better than the one that I planned. What do you think? Yeah, I think so too. All right, let's go through this real quick and we're done. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar, <clears throat> he's the head of gold. The kingdom transfer, transfers excuse me, to Cyrus, and that's the upper torso of silver. And then it transfers to Alexander. Now, I began laying down some foundation for you to appreciate this in some earlier messages. Alexander was represented in the Bible by the symbol of a goat. Very good. How is Satan worshipped today under the symbol of the goat? This was Satan's highest moment in history when his goat conquered the world and all the kingdoms of the world were given into his power. Everything that's going on today is an effort to revive the goat. That's what they're trying to do. And it's the goat against the sheep. The Lamb of God. It's the goat of Satan against the Lamb of God. You are God's sheep. They are the devil's goats. Isn't it fascinating? It's a battle right now and a struggle between the goats and the sheep. And so when we get to the end of it, God's going to separate the goats and the sheep, isn't he? And he's going to judge those goats based on how they treated the sheep. Isn't he? Interesting. So we have old Baphomet. That's what he looks like. I've never seen him personally. This is a picture of some of those devil worshipers took. Anyway, that's how he's represented often in occult literature. <clears throat> but the churches are here resisting him. So we have the spirit of Jesus Christ resisting the spirit of Antichrist. That's the battle that's going on. The sheep and the goats are struggling. One day the sheep will be taken out. And then Antichrist will rise to power. But after that we will come back with the king. And he will take care of business. But what's he doing here? Why is he still here? Don't worry. God's going to get him. <laughs> God's going to finally destroy him in the lake of fire. Let's stand together, please. Father, we're grateful to the time for you, to you, for the time we've had in your word. I pray your word has gotten into us and that we're beginning to understand and comprehend better how things are going, that we might be effective witnesses and, and prophets to our generation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.